Hello, I'm Grant Bartley. To understand consciousness, we need to know the nature of the thoughts we think with. So the question I'll be trying to answer here is, what is our experience of understanding language? That is, what is the content of our understanding of language? Specifically, what is in your mind in addition to the sound or sight of the words themselves, which constitutes your immediate experience of linguistic meaning? There must be something happening in your mind at the very moment of understanding language that marks the difference between you, for instance, just seeing words and those words being understood linguistically. Otherwise, you'd just perceive the words. The mental content of linguistic understanding marks the difference between the understanding you have of the meaning of what I'm saying to you now compared with the meaningless mere sounds you'd hear if you didn't speak English or if I were saying exactly the same things in Swahili, for instance, assuming that you don't understand Swahili. You can hear the words, but you're not experiencing linguistic understanding. This shows that there's something in your mind, in addition to the mere sound of words, which constitutes your linguistic understanding. We're asking what that something is. Our question here is, what is in your mind which constitutes your immediate understanding of the meaning of language? What the immediate mental content of linguistic understanding is interested Locke and Hume to a certain extent, but I don't believe it has been systematically researched as far as I know. So let's start. Here I'll present a model of just what we experience when we understand language. Since one cannot experience another person's experiences, I only have introspection to guide me in analysing my linguistic experience. And you have only introspection of your own experience of language against which to test whether I'm right or wrong. I would hope that you consider whether your own experience confirms what I say about the contents of linguistic understanding to you. I'll assume that your experience of language works in basically the same way as mine, since you have the same basic brain hardware to experience and do language as I have, and because we can understand each other to a significant extent. The theory I'll put forward here is necessarily a little brief, but I think it's both plausible and consistent. In any case, it's the best model of immediate linguistic understanding I know of, since it's the only developed model of immediate linguistic understanding I know of, apart from Locke and Hume and Ludwig Wittgenstein's, who all got a part of it, as we'll see. Undoubtedly, there are significant elements of the understanding of words I haven't thought of here, but this will do for a start, as we're only trying to establish the absolute basics here. So, either in your own language creation, or in the reception of someone else's words, when we understand language, just what is being experienced as the understanding? To summarise it, my theory is that an experience of linguistic meaning involves associating the words and phrases we're hearing or seeing with other experiences. You possibly won't be surprised when I say that our experience of the meaning of language is mostly at the back of our minds. Most of the meaning part of our linguistic experience is liminal, meaning at the edge of consciousness, or in other words, just hinted at. Otherwise, the experiences of linguistic associations which give meanings to words are like our consciously attended experiences, as I will argue. But this theory needs a lot of explanation. One tautology about experience is that each experience is exactly as it is immediately experienced to be. This is in fact only saying that each experience is each experience, which must be true. One significant application of this tautology though is that every use of language means to the person experiencing it precisely what they experience it to mean at that time. However, our sensations of words are only of words when the signs are experienced as being used as words, otherwise they're still just meaningless sounds or squiggles. 
Our question is, what am I experiencing extra when I'm experiencing an understanding of linguistic meaning? In his book Philosophical Investigations, Wittgenstein says that to understand a word is to have knowledge of its use. In a superficially similar way, I'll say that to know the meaning of words is to experience the linguistic operation of signs. Or another curt formulation is that an experience of linguistic meaning is an experience of the linguistic operation of sensations. With this in mind, we can say that words are structured sensations having a linguistic means of mental operation. Maybe the simplest formulation of my core idea is that structured sensations become words, that is, have immediate linguistic meaning, whenever they're accompanied by an awareness of aspects of what those word sensations do linguistically. This experience is formed through automatically applied rules of syntax, semantics and grammar. I mean automatically applied by your brain without your conscious deliberation, mostly. The linguistic means of mental operation covers all aspects of the linguistic operation of words, including knowledge of the use of words in something close to Wittgenstein's sense. But it is no means limited to that. Most of these aspects of the linguistic operation of words we're only partially aware of. We're typically not aware of linguistic operation explicitly. We have our understanding of language without seeing deeply into its contents. But in understanding a phrase, you will be dimly aware of many aspects of the operation of words simultaneously. We'll look at the use of words, knowledge of the referent and other aspects. However, to emphasize, at its most basic, our knowledge of linguistic meaning is a recognition of relationships between the structured sensations we call words and other experiences which I'll call associations. For example, Using the word cat is linked to images and other experiences of cats flashing in your mind. But what are these other experiences? To summarise it less summarily, the theory of language I'll be arguing for is that the content of our immediate understanding of linguistic meaning is experienced associations with words to different degrees of awareness and an immediate understanding of ideas. The association part of this says that our other experience is more or less prominent in the background of your awareness. These associations divide into different types. They can be an immediate referent or definition of the word, knowledge of the use of words and other types of associations which we'll look at later. Moreover, the experience of association works at different levels both experientially and neuronally. The concept of idea is a little more challenging than the concept of association. An immediate understanding of linguistic ideas, I will say, is an immediately symbolized awareness of potential associations. <laughs> So, as well as phrases having experienced associations, phrases symbolise the associations you could make with them. To put the same idea pithily, I will argue that phrases in use encapsulate meanings, and these meanings are ideas. So phrases encapsulate meaning. Big deal, you might think. But this idea has other implications than the mere truism that phrases have meaning. Perhaps the biggest implication is that when we understand ideas, this understanding is largely not experienced in terms of any sensations at all, including anything imagined by you. We'll get into why this is a big deal soon. Generally put, the idea here is that a phrase is a code hinting at or categorising what its words can do linguistically. This all needs explanation, justification, elaboration and illustration.
perhaps surprisingly, we don't even need words to experience linguistic meaning. That is, structured sensations of any type of sensation can act to express ideas linguistically by being signs having associations in a linguistic way. Imagine, for instance, a green giant. The image can have a given meaning to some people without any words being used. So an image can be a visual phrase, depending on how we use it. A lot of my thoughts take this form, and I assume yours do too. But here I want to concentrate on ideas understood verbally in normal language. The first part of my theory of what gives language meaning is the idea that the experience of linguistic meaning includes associating words or phrases with other experiences, then. The associations with words are why words mean anything. Association is being used as a jargon term here. Let me define it. Associations are peripheral experiences creatively connected with the linguistic sign used through memory or, a little less formally, associations are experiences illustrating, defining, or otherwise immediately linked in experience with words or phrases, operating at various degrees of presence in your awareness, from virtually nothing at all to prominence in your mind comparable to that of the sign or word experiences themselves. This use of the word association is not the same as the linguistic philosopher Ferdinand de Saussure's use of it. I also apologise to any cognitive psychologists who have a different mental association with the idea of mental association. But I couldn't think of another term that has the sort of connotations I want. Connotations itself already having an application in linguistic philosophy. So associations it is. In my use of the term, associations are faint experiences called up from memory or created whilst words are being experienced. Associations can be many types of experience, including feelings, complex sensations and examples of the use of words in other phrases. In language use, the mind taps into a reservoir of images or other sensations, or even of thoughts expressed in linguistic terms themselves. The sorts of dimly perceived associations language use invokes include glimpsing a fleeting image, or perhaps remembering a quote, or creating a definition, fleetingly of course, or for people with really fast and detailed imaginations, even imagining a short scene or a melody. Consider for instance the phrase, signing the Declaration of Independence. There may be all sorts of glimpses of experiences in your mind upon receiving that phrase. Maybe a fleeting image of that document. Maybe even a fleeting quote from it. Or perhaps you imagine a historical scene of the signing, starring various rich old white men in wigs. If you're thinking of the signing of the Magna Carta instead, it would be the same demographic, but in fashionable armour rather than wigs. I want to emphasise that we can usually catch only hints of associations while understanding language. For instance, if I think or say the cat stalked the evening rooftops, I may have a fleeting image in my mind of a feline silhouette on top of cold dark tiles. But I won't be very attentive to the image unless it becomes an item of explicit consideration, in which case it has ceased to be a linguistic association in the current sense. Associations with the individual words and phrases are even more ephemeral. Sometimes an association does become more dominant in experience, and I'll talk about that soon. But generally speaking, we experience associations with our use of words without being graphically aware of them. Think about your own understanding of language. For instance, your understanding of these very words in this very phrase. And I think you'll agree that the meaning element is in the background of the experience, 
compared to the sound of the words themselves. Indeed, we often understand the meaning of language without being explicitly aware that our understanding of language even has content beyond the words. This idea of background experiences isn't entirely mysterious to us. I'm sure you can think of occasions when you've been concentrating on a task and, for example, a song comes on the radio, so you'll focus your attention on that. Up to that point, the radio noise was in the background of your experience. You could typically say something like, I was aware that the radio was on, but I wasn't really listening to it. This can work for other modes of sense too, like the TV you at first see only out of the corner of your eye until something attracts your attention on it. Associations with words and phrases I'll take to be in the background of our experience in a similar way to other aspects of experience when we're not focusing our attention on them. The contents of our experience of the meaning of words I think only generally becomes foregrounded in our minds when we reflect on them. For instance, when a person considering the meaning of a word brings to their direct conscious awareness an association with that word that might otherwise have remained in the background. However, as I said, by consciously exploring our associations we've moved from the immediate experience of linguistic meaning to a thought process and a rational reflection on language isn't the same as the immediate understanding of language in the sense we're talking about here. The idea that we're usually not explicitly aware of our associations is the most curious aspect of this theorem. But in fact, I think we're only aware of a minuscule amount of the meaning we experience through the words we're using. There's a lot in our background experience of language use which flavours meaning which we seem to intuitively grasp but whose content we're not explicitly attentive to. So our immediate conscious understanding of the use of words includes much more than we are immediately conscious aware of understanding. This is evidently true but very intriguing. It's like having an awareness of the meaning of words without this being an actual awareness of their meaning. Somewhat paradoxical, but true nevertheless, it seems. Generally, we experience aspects of language at various degrees of prominence in our awareness. What's in the foreground of your understanding mind is normally only the sensation of the words through which the ideas are being expressed. I think it's an issue of what's being paid attention to. Associations are simply less sharply attended to in awareness than the sounds or shapes of the words themselves. The associations you make in any use of language depends both on your life experiences and the present context of the language use in which your nervous system is stimulated to interpret the words. Your understanding of words and of phrases can borrow from myriad galleries of potential sensations and quotations in your memory, and associations are probably made up on the spot too. Which of these elements a person is to what degree aware of depends on what their mind is attending to, as I say. Typically, you're not reminded of the same image of an apple every time you hear or read the word apple, after all. So, insofar as linguistic meaning is an experience of associations, meaning shifts subtly with each use of language. Every time you use a word or phrase, it has a subtly different meaning from every other time you use the same phrase or word due to the different associations experienced with it. This also means that the meaning of words spoken is never the exact meaning of the words heard. Indeed, with the difference in associated meaning with words from person to person, it's amazing we can communicate at all. Perhaps it's a miracle we can even talk meaningfully to ourselves. To add another dimension of complexity both to the experience of meaning and to the neurology underwriting the experience, there are layers of associations. First, associations with individual words, then with phrases, 
than with ideas in the process of rational thought. There is often recursion to associations upon associations, and the associations at each level must work simultaneously, experientially and neuronally. I'll discuss most of this as we go along. Let's start by dividing the background associations we make in our linguistic understanding into two major types. Associations can be purely sensational, or they can themselves be linguistic too. These types are as different from each other as pure sensation itself is from language. First, the associations that are pure sensations. I call these types of associations illustrations. Please remember though that illustrations here are not only visual, but any type of sensory illustration. Depending on your imagination, that is your creative sensory memory, sounds can be illustration associations too. As can also be smells, tastes, feels. For instance, Hearing the phrase, she wore Chanel number no. 5, or he ate roast beef, or just the word suede may suggest you fragrance, taste or texture. I think linguistic illustrations can be as simple as the briefest inner vision of a shade of blue, or as complex as remembering a snatch of a symphony. I have a good visual imagination, as most people will, but have difficulty imagining, that is, fantasizing, the feeling of touch. So touch's mode of illustration is not usually recalled by me in language or otherwise. Even when using touch-based language such as the stubble on my chin felt like sandpaper. So please don't forget that when I say illustrations, I mean various categories of purely sensational associations with words or phrases. But illustration associations are perhaps most easily grasped in terms of images. Here our imaginations flash us pictures as we think or hear or read words. Object words such as piglet, or visually descriptive phrases such as the fiery sunset sky, are typically understood through ideas that literally illustrate them. In his essay concerning human understanding, John Locke argues that linguistic meaning involves associations in the mind between concrete nouns and the sensations, although he seems not to have appreciated that the association a mind makes with words or phrases aren't fixed, but change. What I mean by an illustration association also seems to be equivalent somewhat to David Hume's use of the word idea in his inquiry concerning human understanding. There are also associations with language which are themselves expressed in language. I call the linguistic type of linguistic association an annotation, or sometimes a note. Annotation associations with words and phrases can include remembered phrases, including quotes or song lyrics, or instantly invented phrases, I think. As with illustrations, the annotations that any given word use inspires may be different with each use of the same words the subtle shift in meaning similarly being implied. Again, there are levels or layers to annotation associations. Annotations more in the background of phrases than of individual words, as we'll look at shortly. I also think that the meaning of an annotation is constructed in the same way as the phrase it's being associated with, meaning that annotations have their own associations, including potentially their own annotations. This therefore is a major potential recursiveness in thought. I'll talk again about recursiveness in language at the end. There are other linguistic associations that can't easily be described in either illustration or annotation terms, 
such as associations connected with the intonation of words to convey different attitudes and emotions. Angry, sad, happy, and so on. The point here is that vocal intonations, that is, changes in vocal pitch, also has systematic associations in a similar way to how what is called the semantic information content of words is conveyed, but in the intonation case, conveying emotional content. The emotional tone put into language is called prosody, and so these emotional associations may also be called prosodic associations. The neural activity prosody is usually focused on the surface of the right of the brain, in the middle temporal lobe. Blunt evocation of intonation in writing is text modifications such as italics, bold, capitals, or exclamation marks. The emotional, prosodic, or non semantic aspects of communication must have preceded the sophisticated development of semantic meaning evolutionarily, since the emotional implication of someone's speech is often understandable regardless of what language is being spoken. Also, Children develop intonation understanding before their finer content language skills develop. And significantly, even animals such as dogs respond to tones of voice. To me, this indicates that intonation, just like understanding facial expressions and other aspects of body language or other means of conveying attitude or emotion rather than more detailed information, has its roots in brain developments older than those parts of the cortex where most of the semantic linguistic functions reside. The emotional aspects are the earlier types of understanding to evolve then. Body language would also have its own characteristic associations, as would sign language of course, and logically any other mode of language I haven't thought of. There's more to language than simple associations with words. There are also ideas. Unless I otherwise specify, by idea, I will specifically mean a linguistically expressed thought. For simplicity's sake, we'll say that a phrase is whatever it is understood linguistically as a distinct idea. On this usage, Phrases can be individual words, including gestures and other semi-articulate signs, since by this definition even individual signs are phrases when they're interpreted as distinct ideas. Subphrases are what we'll call parts of a phrase that have coherent meaning themselves, and so are also phrases in their own right, confusingly perhaps. So for the phrase, the pink sports car roared along as it crushed the red flower, the pink sports car, the red flower, as well as the pink sports car roared along and crushed the red flower, are all sub-phrases. Presently, we're not interested in how a phrase comes about, or many of the other typical interests of linguistic philosophers. Instead, we're specifically interested in the contents of our immediate understanding of a phrase's meaning. Or, to phrase it differently, we want to understand how words together yield ideas right now in experience, and what this means. There may be background associations in your mind for the phrase itself and for any subphrases just as the individual words in a phrase may also have their own associations. So phrases can have associations triggered at the individual word level, roared, flower, etc, etc, at the subphrase level, and also at the phrase level, even perhaps at the paragraph level, all forming part of the immediate meaning of the phrase. So in the phrase, the chaffinch hops around the murky pool. Brief images may be generated in your mind corresponding not only to the whole phrase, 
but also to some of the subphrases and words individually. These different associations will be at lower levels of intensity as part of your conscious contents. We may become aware of some of these associations even as we start to form or interpret phrases. And associations for phrases include not only illustrations, but annotations. There are specific types of association, and these each play unique and significant parts in linguistic understanding. For instance, the interpretation of a phrase will often result in a dominant illustration associated with the phrase, by which I mean a noticeably more vivid experience than any other association. Outshining them sometimes as the sun outshines the stars. A dominant association is often an image literally temporally illustrating a phrase in your mind, in the sense that the phrase, the cat sat on the pig, might evoke a very particular image in your mind. In this sense, what I'd call a dominant illustration is what has been called an idea by, for example, Locke or Hume. Once again, the dominant illustration associated with a given phrase will change, potentially for each use of the phrase. Consider once again the phrase, the red flower. This phrase probably invokes an illustration in your imagination, which may well be different from what appeared there when you heard those words before. Subphrases of any degree of complexity might be summarised by a dominant illustration like this. For instance, the image I made glimpse in my mind when I understand the subphrase the cat. We might say the dominant association of a phrase often signifies or stands for the immediate meaning of the phrase. It also might be said that in some senses the dominant illustration is what the phrase immediately means to you. For example, you might say that the immediate meaning of the phrase the dog lay on the chair to you is the image of the dog on a chair that the phrase evokes in your mind. This is reasonable to a limited extent, but I will soon stress that what a phrase fundamentally means at the moment of your understanding it cannot be merely any particular illustration of the phrase that occurs in your mind at that point. Technically, Rather than being what the phrase actually means, which is its idea, but we'll get to that. A dominant association is what I'll call a temporary definition of the phrase. That is, the temporary assigning of a meaning to a word or a phrase immediately in experience. So a temporary definition is a personal and immediate experiential allocation of reference to words. In this temporary sense of definition, One's brain automatically ascribes a working meaning to a word or phrase in one's mind, temporarily attaching a background association to the word or words. More formally, a temporary definition in this sense is a background association which defines the immediate experiential reference of a word for the present use of language. It's whatever you immediately dominantly associate with the present word use. Typically, for an object, this is an image, like the multicoloured beach ball imagined as a result of hearing the phrase, she threw the beach ball at me. Or perhaps more rarely, it's an annotation, an association in terms of words or linguistic meaning. For instance, on hearing, justice for many, mercy for some, one might briefly imagine a definition of justice as, for instance, justice is getting what you deserve. I hope it's evident that I'm not talking about fixed definitions of words or phrases in the dictionary manner. Our minds do not access a mental dictionary to recall some fixed association. Usually, when talking about dominant associations being a temporary definition of words or phrases, I mean instead one of the many possible associations derived through a stock of remembered or created experiences. All dominant associations are temporary definitions of linguistic meaning, I would say. 
Consider, for instance, the word red in the phrase, a penguin with a chainsaw is black and white and red all over. The association you make with that phrase probably includes an image of blood, which functions as a working or immediate reference of the word red. Yet clearly the word red can potentially have many different immediate meanings, that is, many immediate definitions as we're saying. For another instance, the red in the term red double-decker bus. A temporary definition of red can even be annotative. For example, in using or hearing the word red, you could have a background awareness of the phrase, a colour at one end of the visual spectrum. In such ways, in understanding words and phrases, the dominant associations mentally made with the experience of word signs provide temporally experiential definitions of the meaning of those signs for you. Dominant associations are important in linguistic understanding since such definitions specify how words are to be understood in our present use or interpretation of language. But I want to emphasise that as well as the dominant associations, there can be other associations with the phrase or its elements, the individual words and any subphrases. It's crucial to understand, however, that with the more subordinate associations, I'm not necessarily talking about a conscious or in any way well-attended association with words or phrases, but rather about, to a some degree, background association temporarily contributing lightly to the experience of meaning. Temporary definitions often change as a result of the linguistic context changing, suggesting new associations. Associations can be used up and dominance is changed even while we're forming an understanding of a phrase. The associations you're making even with a given word in a phrase may well be in flux until you perceive or pass the phrase as a whole. A words or a subphrases associations may change depending on how complete your understanding of the phrase is then. I imagine that as your understanding of a phrase develops, the meaning of the words or subphrases within it focuses it into a particular set of associations until you comprehend the whole phrase in terms of a set of associations. Then, for a moment, the temporary definition of, say, the phrase emerges. Except it's more complex than this, of course, since your understanding of the meaning of a phrase and so of the words in the phrase will also change as your understanding of the context of the phrase changes, through speech continuing or other alterations. Among other things, this means we can talk about temporarily defining phrases in the same way as we can with words, through a dominant association in your mind with a phrase. The immediate meaning of even a visualised phrase isn't exhausted by the dominant image it provokes, though since there may be other less dominant illustrations alongside it in your experience. For instance, although you might perceive the immediate meaning of the phrase the boat bobbed up and down in the water primarily through an image conjured up in your mind by the phrase as a whole, there may also be more subliminal images associated with the subphrases, which are formed as the phrase is being received. For example, with up and down in the water, Experiencing the meaning of a phrase often involves more faintly experiencing a fluid combination of associations. For a somewhat pre-Raphaelite illustration of the many associations possible with just one phrase, consider the derelict castle covered with ivy guarded the sleeping court. That phrase, I suggest, may evoke many minor images via words or subphrases, alongside a possible dominant association finally illustrating the phrase as a whole. Usually the illustrations of whole phrases are more vividly present in the mind than any association with single words in that phrase, I think. With concrete nouns, that is, object words, 
An experiential reference can become associated with a word through direct perception as well as via imagination, for example by seeing what you're naming. To create a temporary definition of the meaning of the word duck, I can look at a duck, as well as fleetingly think of a duck in images or in words, a quacking bird that loves water, for instance. Your next use of the word duck may well involve a different image or caption. Temporarily defined words can also include verbs and adjectives as well as nouns. Quickly, for example, may be easily associated with some visual illustration in your imagination. On my scheme for language experience, words are either referential or structural. They either refer to some temporary association or idea, or they help structure phrases. In these terms, experiencing the immediate meaning of language involves comprehending either the referent or the function of each word, and there's probably a degree of category overlap. The referent can be either the object or the idea being intended by the linguistic science, and we'll talk about ideas later. I call the words that don't themselves refer to anything, except possibly the logic of language use, structural words, just because they're essential for giving a phrase a meaningful structure. Propositions, conjunctions, and many other types of words are in this structure category, of, the, a, but, and quintessential logic words like not, is. Generally speaking, Structure words help specify the relationships between the referent words. They lend their meaning to phrases through a learnt recognition of their operation or the experienced implication of their use. The application of structure is normally an automatic, computational, non-conscious neuronal process. It's the non-conscious application or analysis by the brain of syntax. By contrast, understanding a referential word such as a noun or adjective seems to necessarily involve consciousness, since this linguistic aspect seems to require a temporary immediate definition, either through sensitive experience or mentally created association. So far, we can summarise that part of our immediate knowledge of linguistic meaning involves perceiving signs and dominant experiences associated with the signs, alongside whatever associations are stalking the background of your experience. I should point out though that sometimes sensational associations are so far in the back of your mind that they're not part of your conscious experience at all. But this means that you can have an understanding of language without necessarily having any sensational awareness of what the contents of this understanding consists in. You are nevertheless aware of the meaning in a different way. Talk more about this curious fact soon. If we all make different associations with the same words, one obvious question is, how can communication be possible? If you mean by a phrase one set of associations and I mean another, how then could I understand what you say? How can we think constructively even to ourselves if the same words have different associations potentially with each thought? So why or how does the cat sat on the pig mean the same to you as it does to me, and the same to me at different times, at least to the useful extent that we can understand another's meaning? I think it's largely because, as an older, wiser Ludwig Wittgenstein pointed out, our understanding of words involves knowledge of their social use, and this group use allows for a shared meaning. Evidently, you must have some sort of understanding of a word's group use to use it when communicating. If you didn't, how could you use it in the same way as someone else? Want to use the word monkey, for instance? Access previous uses of the word, such as the monkey climbed the tree, hand me the monkey wrench, monkeys have tails, etc. 
Does the current use line up with any of these previous examples? Then use monkey. But even this simple idea of the knowledge of the use of words must be broken down into different species of use. We need to recognise that there are several different types of knowledge of the use of words we use, and we ought to remember to distinguish between them. That is, there is a basic difference between a conscious awareness of the use of language and an automatic, non-conscious application by the brain of the appropriate use of words. And although both can be called knowledge of use of language, the first is an awareness of language use, and the second is the brain's non-conscious program for how to use language. The conscious awareness of the use of a word is a very different type of thing from activity which automatically computes the correct use of words in forming a thought or utterance in the non-conscious areas of the brain. There's a huge potential for ambiguity and confusion here, so we must first distinguish a conscious knowledge of the use of words from any non-conscious brain activity only knowledge of their use. Taking the second first, what we can call our non-conscious knowledge of the use of words means the brain's automatic application of learnt rules of phrase formation. Here we're concerned with brain activity setting up for the subsequent generation of particular linguistic experience. This is the brain automatically choosing which words to use in which order. We clearly have major distinctions even for the non-conscious knowledge of the use of words. Since this automatic activity includes the brain computing which words to use, as well as applying its learnt knowledge of how words structure phrases, which we might broadly call an application of good grammar. For the first of these aspects, if I were to put the brain's language logic into words the brain doesn't actually formulate, the brain might compute Use the word red when describing a specific aspect of the visual experience shared by such things as double-decker buses and ladybirds. But language use also needs, for instance, an automatic knowledge of the operation of non-referring words, since they tie together the referring words in specific linguistically necessary ways. So, by the non-conscious knowledge of the use of words, we could mean either the brain's pre-conscious choice of words or the brain's choice of word order and other syntax. We could also include the neurological activity for the generation of association with the words chosen in this category. This would be an unconscious knowledge of which associations to make with any language use, such as making a link between a word and an image the word refers to, which is done automatically by the brain. Concerning the conscious knowledge of the use of words, first, for our usual experience of the meaning of language, we can't mean explicitly remembering previous examples of a use of language and thinking, this is how the word is used. Of course, there are occasions when we're consciously, that is, reflectively wondering about which word is to be used or how. It's on the tip of my tongue, you might say, while doing this. Yet racking your brain searching for the right word, or thinking about how to use words in any other way, is no longer straightforward language use, but a rational reflection on language use. And any thoughtful reflection on your language contents changes those contents from being what I've been calling part of your immediate linguistic understanding into what we can call part of your rational understanding. If you find yourself looking for the right word or thinking, how can I say what I mean? This means that the brain's automatic language creation program has let you down and you must resort to extra neuronal leverage found in conscious deliberation to complete your thought. We're not going to explore reflectional reasoning here. Let's stick to the experience of linguistic meaning itself. That's complicated enough. Conscious knowledge of the use of words as part of linguistic understanding itself means first experiencing associations with words in the sort of way I've been talking about. 
but even this concept of knowledge abuse itself also needs to be more finely divided. We could first say that any background mental associations illustrating or annotating a word or phrase count as examples of knowledge of use in the sense that they are all examples of experiences that word or phrase are connected to in your memory. And the type of dominant association with a word or phrase I called a temporary definition of that word or phrase functions as a more conscious and specific knowledge of use in this sort of sense. For the word cat in the phrase, the cat pounced on the bird, for example, a dominant illustration might act in the following way, to once again put the logic into words the mind brain system doesn't use. This use of the word cat refers to that imagined streak of black and white fur and yellow eyes jumping off that imagined wall. However, to tangle up the ball of wool even further, conscious knowledge of word use could also refer to a distinct category of associations which we can call associations of linguistic use. I'm here talking about the experience of the use of a word that is used as an association in your linguistic experience. By this I mean associations of the meaning of a word attached not merely to just any sensory experiences but to a specific memory of how that word was being used by someone, including by yourself. But you're not quite turned to reflecting on this use. This sort of dominant association could be an annotation, such as a brief remembrance of a word being used in a phrase by someone, or perhaps an image of a phrase in a book. The direction of understanding is crucial when talking about understanding the use of words, whether we're creating our own language use or trying to understand someone else's, that is whether we're expressing or absorbing, communicating or being communicated to. To put it bluntly, knowledge of language use must work differently for speaking and for listening. Grossly oversimplify. When generating language, when thinking it or communicating it to another, even as we think or speak or write them, the words will be accompanied by associations giving us some dim experience of how the language is being used and how words may potentially be used, even if this knowledge is not often significantly attended to. But the interpretation of someone's meaning is not given but must be found. When generating language, the brain knows how to remember associations already present. But while receiving language, we may need more information. In understanding someone else's use of language, we may need to use more prominently conscious memories of the knowledge of use of words to help us understand what's being communicated. To understand what we're being told, we might employ examples of use noticeably higher up the scale of conscious intensity in order to aid specification and understanding. In a further complication of the knowledge of the use of words, are we talking of knowledge during or only after or upon the construction of a phrase? We certainly gain different knowledges as a phrase progresses. Our linguistic understanding has different content as the generational interpretation of a phrase continues. In the case of what we experience developing in a phrase's meaning as a phrase is understood, this might be a set of open possibilities, whereas once a full phrase is known, the knowledge of use is somewhat finalised as part of your interpretation of the phrase's meaning at least until you're caused to change your mind about the interpretation. These types of knowledge abuse are all very different, as I hope you can see. And there will surely be other types of knowledge of the use of words. But we best not get these different senses of the knowledge of use of words confused, or we'll be confused about language in equal measure. When generating language, at least, knowledge of the use of words presently seems to primarily refer to the non-conscious sense of the idea that the creation of linguistic understanding operates according to automatic brain pathways 
carved out through experiences of previous use of language. In other words, it's non-conscious. By contrast, when Wittgenstein wrote that the meaning of a word is its use, I think he meant that while using a word, you have an experience of how the word or phrase is used in the language. However, I'm sure that most language generation cannot proceed according to any explicit experience of the use of word, since by the time you're using a word or phrase, you better already know how to correctly use it. And when constructing phrases, you usually don't have time to think about uses beforehand. When we're understanding what someone else is saying, though, we may decipher them at least partially according to memories explicitly citing previous uses of the same language. It's possible, of course, that Wittgenstein did not distinguish conscious knowledge of the use of words from the brain's knowledge of how to automatically use the language it has learned. Wittgenstein scholars can comment if I'm wrong. As well as the various knowledges of the socially shared use of language, I think there are other reasons why the same phrase can mean the same thing to you as it does to me, and to me as it does to earlier me, at least to the extent that it allows us to practically communicate and so interact constructively. So let's look a bit deeper now at the meaning of phrases. I suggested that the meaning of a phrase or a word may be temporarily defined to a mind through a dominant background image or other association. In this way, ideas may be illustrated in our awareness of language with thumbnail sketches of their meanings. This is like placing a temporary or working meaning in your understanding. A major complication concerning the immediate experiential meaning of language is, however, that the meaning of any phrase must be more than any associations experienced alongside the words. The cat is black and white, for instance, must mean more than any dominant or other images evoked by the phrase, since if the immediate meaning of any phrase were simply any of the associations we make with its words at that time, a phrase would still not mean the same thing from one expression to the next. The same idea could be illustrated with limitless images of cats and pigs, depending on how much spare time you have. Here, the use is consistent, even though the meaning continually changes. I'll say that what's being pointed to or represented by any phrase is an idea. I want to argue that the same phrase can evoke different associations for me and you as we talk, or for me at different times, yet still express the same basic idea. So whether we're talking about the humblest groan, or the conclusion of the most grandiose meta-theory inspired into a human head, the main means of meaning to minds are the ideas expressed through language. Thus we begin to spy out the second major constituent of meaning in language, which is the fact that a meaningful phrase means an idea. In the history of philosophy, the word idea has referred to many different ideas. The original philosophical sense was Plato's use of eidos, which is more commonly translated form, but which literally means what has been seen. By aidos, Plato meant a type of freely existing exemplar of a thing or concept that could be grasped by a mind. I've already mentioned that for human Locke, an idea meant an image to the mind. Bishop George Barclay, meanwhile, had ideas all of his own, including in the mind of God. But for us, I want the word idea specifically to refer to the thought expressed through language. This sense of idea makes it the experiential equivalent of what philosophers of language call a proposition, or sometimes the conceptual meaning of a phrase. These terms also refer to the core meaning of a phrase, but more formally, 
that is to say, as abstracted from immediate experience. A proposition is not typically analysed in terms of the individual's experience of meaning, but in terms of its logical and semantic implications. But currently we are only interested in the meaning of a phrase in a person's experience. Ideas has the connotation I want here, as what a mind understands in semantically or verbally meaningful experience. We can also reverse the definition direction to say that a phrase is a set of signs put together in a way which expresses an idea. So we can refine the definition of an idea into a thought expressed through a set of signs. Strictly speaking, signs are types of structured sensations. If so, then strictly speaking, phrases are sensationally structured representations or ideas. The creation of complex linguistic meaning is the birth of the idea. Without the ideas which the complex structured sensations of language mean to the person experiencing them, there isn't full language use in the animal mind. There's just sensational perceptions of the world and remembered illustration associations. This is the sort of linguistic level I take animals such as birds and most mammals to have. The ability to associate sounds with the experiences of the world or memories of it. Complexity of meaning is achieved most fully, but not exclusively in humanity. The fullest use of linguistic thought is, I think, the experience of abstract ideas, such as justice, love, reality, truth, etc. Ideas which cannot be represented by any one concrete perceivable thing, and so are correspondingly complex. There are some notable similarities between ideas and propositions. For instance, like a proposition, an idea is not the language itself. Ideas are not equivalent to their expressions. The language is rather the vehicle or medium for the idea or proposition. The idea must be different from the signs that specify it, we might say. Firstly, the same idea or proposition can be expressed in different languages. The Chalet Noir expresses the same idea or proposition as the cat is black. The idea or proposition that the cat is black. The same basic idea can be expressed through several different English phrases too. The feline is sable, the moggy is the shade of midnight, refer to basically the same idea. Nuanced associations will be lost in each translation of course, but then many nuances are lost in every act of communication between speaker and listener, or even between uses of the same phrase for the same individual. The periphery of meaning changes but the core meaning, the core idea, can still be communicated, I say, because it is not its dominant association. Not every phrase is attended by an association experience in any case. For instance, what experience reveals the very meaning of this very phrase to you? It doesn't conjure up any sort of useful image, at least in my mind. And even if it did, that sentence could not mean only that isolated image. So even when there is a dominant association, the experience still only points to the idea. The correct thing to say then, is that an idea can be revealed through a dominant illustration, but the real or deeper meaning of the phrase, its idea, is not that experience. Rather, we might better say that language is used to represent ideas to the mind. By idea here, I mean, however, not something abstract, but specifically something in the experience of the person experiencing it at that unique time. This, however, creates an enigma. There seems nothing sensational in linguistic understanding Apart from the sensations of the words and any associations experienced with them, 
including some elements of feelings. What then is an idea and how do phrases mean the idea their words convey? And what does a mind experience when knowing ideas? We've seen that an idea is not the experiences that point to it, either the words or their associations, but rather what is pointed to. Nevertheless, we are aware of each phrase's core meaning, its idea as meaning something, since everything that means something means something. But what else is there in our immediate experience of linguistic understanding, apart from experience of the signs, the word and the phrase associations, and maybe some inexpressible feelings? Nothing I can perceive or sense. It seems then that we don't experience the idea itself in a sensational manner. In other words, our experience of linguistic meaning centrally involves a conscious experience whose contents are not sensationally present to consciousness. So understanding language is not only experiencing layers of structured sensations, but includes something else which has nothing to do with sensational experiences. This might be an unexpected conclusion about the most human of experiences, the meaning of language, but it is a pivotal fact about the nature of experience, nevertheless. The major part of the information conveyed by language is not sensed, even in the background of experience, but is understood in a different way. There is more to our experience than can be experienced sensationally. Our core understanding of the meaning of words is apparently experienced in a way unlike anything else we've so far considered. But if an idea of experience is characteristically not in terms of sensations, in what terms is an idea conveyed by a phrase? What is our fullest experience of the meaning of phrases? Since all the sensational aspects of the experience of language have been accounted for by word signs and their background associations, someone whose mind is somewhat limited to sensations might argue that minds that understand the ideas that phrase communicate without there being any extra content to this understanding. They might say that our linguistic understanding of ideas just is. Each idea is just taken to be understood. I don't want to say that though. There is no justice in philosophy. In the absence of a better idea, the idea about ideas I'll be suggesting is that in addition to phrases generating dimly experienced associations, phrases themselves symbolise the associations you could make with them. Let me explain. One assumption we're using throughout this discussion is that all the contents of your mind are correlated with activity in your brain. Sensory experiences, thoughts, feelings, everything we immediately experience is set by neural activity. Since the immediate experience of language is a type of experience, the experience of ideas as the meaning of a phrase must also be something human brains are capable of facilitating. And since ideas are thoughts expressed through language, the nature of ideas is almost certainly connected with our experience of learning language too. With these ideas in mind, I suggest that our experience of an idea as the meaning of a phrase incorporates memory trace connections to the phrase beyond those neural traces that result in an association experience. Neurological connections your brain could make with a word or phrase. So if I say the parrot exploded, the meaning of that phrase to you now isn't simply whatever image you just thought of. It also incorporates many of the unexperienced possible images and other associations 
your brain could have made to the phrase according to the contents of your memory and your brain's creativity. In other words, we know the language memories we don't experience. For the sake of argument, and with nothing better to replace it with, let's suppose then that the idea as experienced is related to the many memory traces our brain might connect to the words expressing an idea. Consider all the images of the word cat you might even now think of when reading or hearing the word, for example. All associations involve connecting word use neurology with neural memory traces. So potential association connections are patterns of activity in the brain that could potentially inform experience. Each idea experienced includes some subset of these potential connections somehow. The experience of an idea a phrase expresses can't be an experience of all its potential associations because we don't consciously experience all these memory connections. Rather, a phrase somehow hints at these associations without all these associations being experienced. Also, many phrases are not illustrated by anything but still have meaning. This is true of many of the phrases I'm speaking now, for instance, such as this one. So there must be some other type of experience than an association it constitutes or represents the fuller meaning of an idea communicated by a phrase. My idea is that the immediate meaning of an idea includes representing or signifying a set of neurological traces or trains of neural activity connected with previous experiences of the same use of language and maybe some rogue memory traces too. We know these memory traces are there somehow. In any case, something constitutes our knowledge of the meaning of a phrase as being more than whatever dominant association the phrase evokes. Any dominant associations merely illustrate the meaning, but the meaning of a phrase is more than anything immediately illustrating it to your mind. Importantly, this is knowledge apart from the sensational aspects of linguistic understanding. Crucially, we don't sensationally experience this meaning, Rather, we perceive that the phrase has this meaning. That is, since we experience the meaning of any phrase as not just some image, say, there must be something else going on in your linguistic experience constituting this knowledge of potential connections. This implies an experience that there are potential connections. This is an experience of what associations could be evoked through that brain activity by that use of language, but which are not consciously evoked. Perhaps they're not yet fully revealed, or perhaps beyond our attention, but we know those connections have potential. If this is true, then a major aspect of your experience of the meaning of language includes your word use brain activity connecting with word memory brain activity whose content you're not then caused to sensationally experience as associations. But what is this experience like? Let's suppose that most briefly put, ideas are sets of potential and actual associations with phrases. Or how do we experience a connection with otherwise unexperienced neural traces? Well, my idea is that your experience of understanding an idea being expressed through a phrase involves not only experiencing the words and associations, but also a recognition of the other associations you could make which are not experienced. Or to put it in a simple phrase, understanding an idea is like experiencing a summary of potential associations with a phrase. More formally put, your immediate experience of an idea 
is an encapsulation of the associations your brain could make with the phrase according to the contents of your memory. This encapsulation experience includes an acknowledgement of potential associations with a phrase that isn't those associations being experienced. The idea of encapsulation is specifically that a phrase itself can be thought of as a temporary symbol of one's immediate knowledge of its implied connections, and we experience this symbolism as the phrase. A metaphor that might be helpful for understanding this is that the experience of the meaning of ideas is like an assurance that if you stop to consciously reflect, you'd become explicitly aware of many illustrations and annotations you could associate with a phrase. My own experience of the meaning of a phrase, apart from any experienced associations, is as if my mind assumes it knows what a phrase means without sensationally or otherwise experiencing that meaning deeply. Rather, I have an experience that the phrase has significant meaning, its idea contents. On the present theory, this is experiencing that there are possible memory connections with the words, or knowing that there are many more possible temporary definitions of the phrase. So, for example, in understanding the phrase, the cat sat on the pig, many neural connections your brain has just made with those words are encapsulated by the phrase itself. And this is more central to the present meaning of that phrase to you than any illustrations of pigs on cats that may have been just seen by your eyes or evoked in your mind. So I'm suggesting that the core experience of linguistic meaning is as if of a summary of a set of memory neuronal connections with a phrase. I'm also suggesting that a phrase's core meaning is encapsulated by or summarized as the phrase itself. To clarify, I mean by this that a phrase itself represents its possible connections. My way of imagining this is that in our experience of understanding language, phrases are experienced as something like links for a catalogue of information in our memory circuits. This is almost the idea that each phrase acts like an index for the mind to memories merely standing for what an in-depth analysis of the memory connections with the words might reveal. You might also say that phrases are experienced indices for the contents of our association buffer, if that helps at all. This major aspect of the immediate linguistic meaning of a phrase we might call a summary of potential associations. Let's bring together this recognition of unexperienced neural connections with the experienced memory associations, including any dominant associations acting as temporary definitions for the meaning of the phrase. Together, these two aspects, experienced and unexperienced associations as we could call them, constitute the immediate meaning of a phrase to the person understanding it. We might call this the phrase's working idea. So a set of signs has linguistic significance by standing for its possible and actual associations. And this is how a phrase represents its idea in immediate experience. Most simply put, the meaning of a phrase is its actual and potential associations. The part of mind experiencing the non-sensational aspect of understanding is called the intellect, which we can, like Immanuel Kant, 
define as that part of understanding which operates beyond sensational experience. So intellectual understanding refers specifically to the contents of understanding not being mediated by sensations. Phrases encapsulate this intellectual understanding even while experienced associations exemplify the idea under scrutiny. Although every use of a phrase may connect with different sets of possible associations, the experience expressed through a phrase can mean the same thing, be basically the same idea from use to use, because we socially channel the meaning of words to be functionally similar over many uses. The use of words being similar enough from person to person to allow some degree of communication is down to the regulation of the use of words by a community of language users. So this is what this word means to you too. A recognition of the shared uses of words means that we can mean usefully similar things to each other when we use those same words, despite our different sets of experiences to associate with them. But by this knowledge of use, we can have ideas of what someone's talking about, at least insightful enough that we can practically respond to their communiques. Knowledge of the shared use of words, both in experience and automatically applied by brain programs, defines which associations we make with which words, or as we might say, chooses what our words refer to for our use. But because it's regulated by shared use, the different sets of possible associations are predominantly within the range of associations which would connect with the same things, as in others' use of their same words, with objects such as chickens, or actions such as running. This makes them in accord with the communal use of words, in a way that all coherent language must be. This also means that the culturally sustained concept or meaning of a word does not substantially change from use to use. The general meaning of the use of the word swan in English, for example. Indeed, I called one's personal dominant association with phrases only temporary definitions of language meaning, to contrast them with ideas, for which the core implications of a phrase stays the same even when the associations with the phrase change. Yet communication breaks down when the meaning of the same words is too different for the speaker and the listener. The intellectual encapsulation of the core meaning of phrases can occur because when we use language, we tumble from word to word, subphrase to subphrase, phrase to phrase, so fast we don't spend much time realising how little we understand each word or phrase, even as we use it. We often understand just enough to direct our mind states through some barely registered conscious associations with the words, and so we act on half-perceived thoughts and barely perceived meanings. Linguistic understanding always involves interpretation because there's always more than one possible meaning. Even identifying a sensation as a word is a type of interpretation. But that's just the start. Each phrase or word can have many possible interpretations. To interpret interpretation further, I'll define doing interpretation as promoting one meaning of a use of signs over alternative possible meanings, or in noun rather than verb form, the interpretation of a phrase is the instantaneous understanding of a phrase. Thus by interpretation the verb, or gerund possibly, I mean setting the meaning of a phrase. The result of this action, the noun, is the immediate linguistic meaning of a phrase and meaning, we remember, is a phrase's actual and potential associations. Interpretation must work differently for receiving language than for generating it, or as I might more clearly say, for listening rather than for speaking. 
by the time you're speaking, you better know the meaning of the words you're saying. When you create language, it comes into being for your mind as understood by you. So when you're generating language, expressing it, or even just thinking thoughts, it already has meaning to you, even if that's only semi-formed rather than fully phrasal and fully formed. But in receiving language, hearing, seeing, feeling it, it comes into your mind from outside your mind, so a process of interpretation is required. We must actively interpret words received. The next thing to recognise is that language is interpreted in context. Context helps refine the meaning of signs from among alternative possibilities. The immediate context for linguistic interpretation is language itself. The subphrases, phrases and extended narrative that the language we're interpreted is embedded in and all the associations that attend all these signs. For example, the word associations in the previous phrase is embedded in the subphrase, the associations that attend. The subphrase is embedded in the phrase, the phrase in the sentence, the sentence in this paragraph, and this paragraph in this whole ongoing talk on language. This is the immediate interpretive context for all these words. Then there is the general context of what's happening in the wider world. Who's saying what, where, when and how. We could perhaps say that our most immediate context for linguistic understanding is the content of the mind of the understander during the interpretation. Here the context for language is all the mental contents then connected to the words being used including prosody if the words are heard. To remind us, prosody, also known as intonation, is the aspect of speech which conveys the emotional intention of the utterance, whether angry, happy, sad or sarcastic. I've argued that the immediate meaning of a phrase is centrally the idea it generates in the mind of the person understanding it. The idea is often spotlighted to a mind through a dominant association, or perhaps through a couple of them, with other nuances further in the background of the experience. But the most significant aspect of meaning of the phrase is nevertheless knowledge of the idea as a whole, and this means the complete set of connections encapsulated by the phrase in that moment. So we can say that the interpretation of a phrase would centrally be the determination for a person that the phrase refers to one idea rather than any others. So interpretation is determination of that set of associations, for prosody as well as for semantics. So as a noun, what the interpretation of a phrase is is a set of associations either experienced or summarised as a phrase. Or, as a process, or if you like a verb, the immediate interpretation of a phrase is determining the phrase's potential and actual associations. In some strong sense, then, associations provide both the major context and the means for interpreting language. We can turn this concept around and say that seen, heard or felt, what makes a meaningful linguistic phrase rather than an incoherent, meaningless set of marks, involves evoking a set of actual and potential associations with those signs. Please note that although there may be many associations attending a phrase, there is one interpretation of a phrase at any time to any person, the set of actual and potential associations or in neural terms, the set of neural connections that person is making with the words of the phrase. Ultimately, physically speaking, an interpretation depends on which neural activities are being linked to the word signs being used. On this understanding, each possible interpretation represents a subtly different idea even if the variation is just by one association with the words. 
and each possible set of neural connections represents a subtly different idea, although it may be basically the same. The differences may be as fine as can be demonstrated by the finest variation in brain connectivity. To be basically the same idea as the idea held in another's mind in response to the same use of language, I would say that one set of associations must be capable of being referred to in the same way linguistically as their set of associations are. This is again the idea of a shared use of words. Recursion is a significant aspect of the operation of language that we must briefly return to now. Recursion means something feeding back on itself and repeating. Language is recursive first in the sense that some of the associations that give word signs linguistic meaning are themselves language. There are background experiences to words or phrases which are themselves words or phrases. I call such linguistic associations with words annotations. This could be, say, a quote. In thinking the subphrase the use of the word, one might briefly think the phrase in the beginning was the word. In accordance with the present understanding of language, to have linguistic meaning themselves, any annotation associations must have their own associations, possibly including further linguistic ones, in layers. This association, being language itself, could potentially itself generate the need for knowledge in its own even more fleeting background experience. For example, for the subphrase in the beginning, a beginning is a delicate time. The dominant associations with a phrase we might call the first layer of linguistic experience, and annotations will add more layers. But I think these associations are experienced in rapidly diminishing prominence. Perhaps there's no theoretical end to the potential layers of experience of associations in the understanding of phrases which involve phrases. Practically, however, there's only so much brain processing possible in the fast-moving world of thought before the next phrase turns up needing to be understood. As I already mentioned briefly, we barely have time to think about the meaning of one subphrase or phrase before we must move on to the next. Also, brains are not infinite in the awareness they can encode in their activity. So we should draw a clear distinction between potentially recursive and actually recursive. And note that our immediate experience is not an infinite regress of meanings. I think the practical boundaries to recursion in linguistic understanding are the limits of attention. The awareness of recursive associations only goes as far as the attention of awareness having the linguistic understanding. No doubt our linguistic understanding is nevertheless a tangled web of interconnections, as is the brain activity that goes with it. A wide scale type of recursiveness in language is that the brain has the means to generate ideas about ideas. In rational thinking, we use ideas to illuminate or think about ideas. Furthermore, the knowledge generated by this thought process is often itself understood in terms of ideas. So yet another type of regress is possible. Ideas generating further ideas, generating further ideas, and so on and so on and so on. This potential infinite regress of ideas may seem similar to the potential infinite regress in the immediate understanding of words. We're actually talking about the same thing happening at two different levels of language-based thought. First at the level of linguistic meaning per se, then at the level of reasoning, which uses linguistic meaning to generate further ideas. But as it is with understanding words, I don't think reasons through regressive understanding, ideas through rationally generating more, comes close to being infinite to any mind other than God's.
Finally, let me summarise my theory of the nature of the experience of linguistic meaning. The first principle is that, logically rather than temporally speaking, there are levels of thought in linguistic thought. Understanding language obviously involves the pure sensation of the language itself, hearing or seeing or feeling the marks or signs which make up the words. But to make this experience explicitly an experience of language rather than just a sensation, this sensation must be accompanied with the appropriate background awarenesses. I suggested that this is in various ways an awareness of associations. These associations can be at the level of words, subphrases, phrases, and can function with temporary definitions or knowledge of uses, for instance. This set of experienced and potentially experienced association is the functioning idea or meaning of a phrase for a mind at that time. The core meaning of a phrase is the immediate idea. And all of this happens according to the rules of good function within an expanding environment of linguistic use. Many of these rules of experience and interpretation are applied automatically by learnt brain processes, even while life is happening all around you. Although I've laid out some individual parts that constitute the immediate experience of a linguistic meaning, I think knowledge of the meaning of words involves many of these aspects of the linguistic operation of signs operating simultaneously. In other words, the meaning of a phrase to someone is all aspects of their immediate experience of the operation of the words of the phrase. This includes the experience of the word signs themselves and brief experiences of background associations, as in glimpses of images when we use words. These associations also include knowledge of use and definitions of concepts. However, our understanding of linguistic meaning is not limited to these facets, but it is also an experience of the overall idea conveyed by a phrase. Not equivalent to any one or two associations we may make with the words. We considered the concept that the idea conveyed by a phrase is potential associations summarised in the experience of the phrase. The concept is that the experience of a phrase has an extra content that stands for the connections our brains could make with that use of language, but don't turn into experienced associations. Putting these ideas together, this means that an experience of linguistic meaning is achieved through mental associations with signs, either experienced or implied. So for general purposes, we can say that a phrase has meaning because it stands for associations experienced of various degrees of presence. We might generally say that Linguistic meaning involves mentally presenting actual and potential associations alongside sensational signs. More broadly speaking, language is a system of signs evoking various associations in minds in various ways. Thank you.